1996, my telephone rings. You guys are in your office. I'm in my chambers. And the voice says, uh, Judge, now I'm still not completely used to being called Judge, but I'm getting used to being called Judge, and I know that means me. <laughs> There's a man at reception, his name is Henry, and he says he has an appointment to meet with you. And I said, please send him to the security gate. And I go to meet him, and my heart is beating. Henry had telephoned me earlier that week to say that he was the person who'd organized the bomb in my car that blew up my arm. He's now going to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Am I willing to speak to him? And I walk down the corridor and I open this door and I see Henry. I'm going to flash back. I'm not Judge L.B. Sachs, I'm former advocate L.B. Sachs of the Cape Town Bar. And I'm in London. I take the train. I'm told where to get off at Falmer. I'm given directions about where to go. And told that Colonel Draper is expecting you. And I knock on the door. And a very, as I recall, strong, what I would call British voice, Come in. And I open the door and I see Colonel Draper. I'd been prepared. He had, I think it's called spondylitis. So his neck was permanently bent. A strong voice coming from somebody speaking to you in a very forceful way. And he welcomes me. And he and Professor Norman Cohen, who'd written a book called Pursuit of the Millennium, about the children's crusades in the 13th, 14th century, trying to extract from that extraordinary, astonishing experience the explanation of Hitler. What's going on when hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people follow crazed leadership? And working from a psychoanalytical background, relating it to the destruction of the, I'm simplifying now, but of the father figure of authority due to various causes, and then the eagerness to find a powerful figure that will solve these enormous forms of distress could hardly have been further away from the analysis of the functioning of the judiciary in racially stratified South Africa. But he could see some kind of connection. And then Colonel Draper, the nearest thing to a law, he wasn't professor then, he wasn't professor colonel or colonel professor, he was just Colonel Draper. And very early on he says to me, it's just one a strong piece of advice. I'm not going to try and do his British accent, but give you something of his voice that I'd give you. A good thesis makes a bad book, <laughs> and a good book is a bad thesis. That was the only advice he gave me. <laughs> And I ignored it completely. <laughs> Here is the thesis. It's been allowed out 
from the library because this is an exceptionally exceptional occasion. And I'm terrified I'm going to spill a bit of water on it. And I'd come as a refugee to the United Kingdom. I never thought of myself as a refugee. I was a freedom fighter in the struggle out of my country. But now I say as a refugee. I proudly say I came as a refugee. Because people have the idea of refugees as these helpless beings. We've got to look after them, be kind to them. They've known so much trauma. I came as a proud person wanting to continue the struggle. And I met wonderful people in the UK whom I mightn't have met otherwise. Sir Robert Burley, former headmaster of Eton, profoundly, from a very conservative background, but profoundly anti-fascist. He'd been involved in re-establishing an education system in what was then occupied Germany after World War II. And I suppose there's nothing more powerful than an upper class person with strong ideals in terms of confidence and presentation. And he invited me and I was then married to Stephanie Kemp, who'd also been in prison in South Africa, to meet him at the Reform Club. I'd never been to a club. It wasn't my scene exactly. And his wife was there and his daughter. And it was significant. The Reform Club had opened its doors to women for the first time. And I still remember them coming in and saying, is this what we were trying to get into? <laughs> Dull, boring, deep armchairs, people speaking softly. And then he wants to know what are my plans. And I indicate, I've been a lawyer and advocate for 10 years. I'd like to get out of law and do something else. It's good to have different vocations in life. Uh, but I'm thinking that maybe, maybe, maybe I can do a PhD. I already had a BA LLB. I could do a PhD on this extraordinarily strange and bizarre, almost unfathomable thing called the South African judiciary where I'd been practicing. On the one hand, refined, thoughtful discourse of justice and law, intelligent, you prepare, you're handling a whole range of cases dealing with crime, with uh, family law, with company law, corporation law. Erudite, the language of justice and fairness. And on the other hand, the same judiciary is ensuring 100 South Africans are hanged every year, overwhelmingly black, overwhelmingly for either killing or raping white people, part of the social control in the country. 30, 40, 50,000 people judicially whipped every year. Thousands of kids beaten, teach them a lesson with a cane. The law being enforced to compel black people to carry a pass, show them any time of day. You can't be here, you can't be there, you can't go anywhere. All done through the law. So the same judiciary that is using that language used internationally of justice is responsible for brutal oppression and doing so in a kind of dignified voice. And we're trying to use what tiny spaces they were to save people's lives, to expose the injustices, a terrain of struggle, we called it, in, in the courts. So this phenomenon, I felt, let me try and explain it. How does it manage with all these contradictions? And I could do a PhD on that. 
And so Robert tells me about a center at Sussex University, newly created, dealing with persecution and extermination. And he thinks that he can get funding from the Joseph Roundtree Charitable Trust for me to do the PhD. Not a very magnificent stipend, but something in a place. And I'll work for three years on my PhD. It'll give me a chance to find out what else I can do. And now I'm meeting Colonel Draper, and I'm getting that advice. And I know that I'm going to cheat him from the word go. <laughs> this is an interesting story. It needs to be known. Why should a good thesis be unreadable, dense, inaccessible, unduly complex to prove it's a good thesis? And why should a book be unscientific and not based on evidence? In any event, I dutifully nodded. And then he went on to tell me stories about Nuremberg. I wished I'd recorded them. I wished I'd somehow got hold of them. I've forgotten them. I can't remember one. I just remember every week I looked forward to grand things, small things, details, but making me feel the dramatic quality of that place and space and what it was like working there. And feeling proud to be associated with and connected with somebody who'd been there and who is now imparting the experiences, recording them, introducing them into the university, and the university seeing the significance and importance of having somebody like him there. So he put Nuremberg into my head. I think there's a whole generation and another generation, maybe three generations almost, who don't know about Nuremberg, but deeply implanted in my head what was happening there. And I'm glad I got that wisdom from him and that sense of special connection. Some people have said since then, oh, Nuremberg, it was the victor's justice and being rather dismissive of it. We can't afford that. There were grotesque, horrible crimes committed on a huge scale that challenged the very nation, notion of humanity based on ugly racist notions and based on a kind of international law that was built not on notions of human rights and fundamental rights, but on methods of power and containing power and alliances. And so if your country attacked another country, the remedy would be the other country will be more powerful than you because of the alliances. It wasn't based on concepts of basic rights. And Nuremberg, it didn't capture the biggest criminals and scoundrels. They had killed themselves or died at the end of the war, Hitler, Goebbels. Goering had been captured. He was like, in that sense, a very big figure symbolically and in terms of what he did. Somebody gave him cyanide pill, he died. Its significance wasn't the people, individuals on trial, and even what they'd done. The significance was accumulating evidence of stuff that had been done secretly. The very least that was owed to those who died, knowledge about it. They didn't just disappear and vanish. And this theme established now, genocide is not acceptable. Not just morally not acceptable, it's legally not acceptable. It violates the very nation of a common humanity in the world. The idea that you can 
tell another nation, if you don't submit to our demands, we're going to attack you and we set a date and we attack you. The crime of destroying the peace becomes a crime in international law, recognized as such. And all's not fair in love and war. And it's not only things that are expressly forbidden, like gas, certain kinds of munitions. There's a cruelty in war that's totally unacceptable. War is ugly and terrible to begin with, but that's not to say once it's war, anything goes. And these things are firmly established. And they're established on a multinational basis with people from the East and the West, the Soviet Union's involved, and the United States, uh, France, different legal systems, getting certain common rules so in itself, it's the beginning of serious international criminal law. So much has flowed from that since then, but it needed a foundation. That foundation was laid at Nuremberg. It was significant for humanity, important for humanity. There have been critiques. saying it's Victor's justice. Yes, it was Victor's justice. The victory was for people who were standing for some idea of common humanity, anti-racist, and they were insisting that their vision of the world should become the norm, the standard for the world, and not the idea of the strongest of some nations, groups, destined to rule and dominate others. It became the foundation of the United Nations. It actually gave huge support to the anti-colonial movement, because the logic was now colonialism couldn't be sustained anymore. The notion of empire had to decay afterwards. A lot of positive things emerged from that. I think there's one valid point in terms of Victor's justice. An argument could have been made that the Allies themselves had breached certain standards. The firebombing of Dresden, with hundreds of thousands of civilians being killed, Hiroshima atom bomb. Perhaps there was that kind of imbalance, but it didn't mean that the denunciation through Nuremberg of Nazism wasn't absolutely valid. And for me, perhaps a more important critique, it's not of the process, but one of the consequences of Nuremberg was, okay, you've captured the crooks, you put them on trial, you've hanged a certain number, now let's move on. As though somehow all the responsibility for Nazism now disappears, we've taken action against it. And the people of Germany, who'd in huge numbers gone along with Hitler Nazism, can say, it's over. Now we rebuild the country, and it's good they rebuilt the country, but it's not to do with us. It's those scoundrels they've been got rid of, gotten rid of. And it took two more generations, the grandchildren, to now saying, Grandpa, Daddy, Mommy, where were you? What were you doing? Why didn't you do more? Why didn't you tell us? So from that point of view, the trial by encapsulating the whole process, expressed humanity's denunciation of the cruelty and the terror, but it also limited the theme of accountability to that particular process. 
And I think that's a valid comment and a comment that was made by another generation of young Germans themselves, that our whole nation should have been involved and we have to take responsibility and think about where we were, what were we doing, what didn't we do. I now jump to 1988. I'm in Lusaka. January the 8th was the date on which the ANC was founded in, in 1912. So every year now, January the 8th, the ANC makes a statement. And Oliver Tumble's making a statement. And he invites the press to ask questions afterwards. And the first question from a journalist is, are you in South Africa, in the ANC, planning to have Nuremberg trials? We're in exile. Our leaders are locked up in Robben Island. There's states of emergency in the country, as we heard. Troops are in the townships. And the journalist is asking us, are we planning to have Nuremberg trials? There's just a little thing about bringing down apartheid first. <laughs> and it's a trick question. If you say we're not going to do it, then you're giving away something in advance for nothing. You don't know what the people might say. If you say we are, then what incentive is there for the people who've got the keys to the jail who are commanding to concede? And it makes us look like empty people. Blah, 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 we're going to put them on trial and so on, and here we are in exile far and far away. And Oliver Tumble very, very skillfully found a way of saying that these are not the issues on the agenda now, we've got lots of other issues, and when the time passes and uh, people are in position to take their decisions, I'm sure they'll make the right decision, something like that. So now I move forward again to 1993. The National Executive of the ANC is meeting. Uh, I still remember it was at the Lutheran Center outside Johannesburg. And we used to meet frequently at the residences or the teaching places of faith communities. And partly they didn't charge any money for it. Partly it was very strategic to tell them, don't be frightened of us, we're not anti-religious. And I still remember the, the variation in the catering uh, and the Muslim community far and away the best. The Lutherans were second, that's why I'm speaking. The Anglicans, okay. The Methodists, you bring your own sandwiches. <laughs> Don't spoil the body. Any event, we're having a very, very, very intense debate at the Lutheran Center. And the issue on the agenda is what to do about a report that the ANC had commissioned concerning the use of torture by ANC operatives against captured enemy agents in the struggle times. And the people who did the investigation, there was an African-American judge, uh, there was a South African business person, head of the African Chamber of Commerce, and a head of prosecution in Zambia, had interviewed people, and their report was, we heard very credible evidence that there were abuses of fundamental rights in the ANC camps in Angola. And we recommend that the ANC takes appropriate action to deal with it. And we argue about what to do. Now, I'd heard about that when Oliver Tambo had called me to Lusaka told me 
We have nothing in our constitution that deals, what do you do with captured enemy agents? I'm sure the Labour Party doesn't have a clause, what do you do with captured enemy agents? Or what do you do with agents in your own party you'd like to lock up? And I said, oh, the international instruments that say no cruel and human degrading punishment or treatment, no torture. And he says, we use torture. I'm stunned. We use torture. He doesn't tell me why, he just says, we've been using torture. This is now around about 1983. And of all the work that I've done, and I've helped to write the South African Constitution, I've written judgments for the Constitutional Court. Of all the legal work that I've done, I'd say the most important was a code of conduct for the ANC in exile to deal with what you do with not only captured enemy agents, but comrades who go in for sexual assault or steal money or drive when they're drunk or stab. And what do you do with captured enemy agents? And we set up tribunals. Charges had to be brought. We had defense counsel. And from then onwards, I wouldn't like to say there was never any abuses afterwards, but it was totally turned around. Important people who were in charge of the camps were replaced, but there was a sense of legality in the struggle and when people ask, how come we've got such an advanced progressive Bill of Rights in South Africa today? It's partly because already during the struggle, we had this idea, we are fighting for freedom and the ideas of freedom must exist inside our own ranks. So it wasn't as though this was a continuing thing, secret being suppressed. But they were saying, you did those things that were wrong and you must take action, there must be accountability. And we're debating what to do about it. And some of us stand up uh, and say they've made the report, what's the problem? And others say, it's hard on these gods. They were youngsters just out of school. They didn't know. They weren't trained as police. When they were caught in South Africa, they got beaten up. They thought that's what you do, you beat up. Don't go for them. Uh, Paolo Jordan, one of our great, great, great intellectuals, son of the first black professor at University of Cape Town, stands up in high-pitched voice, Comrades, I've learned something very interesting today. There's a thing called regime torture that's bad, and there's ANC torture that's okay. <laughs> Thank you for enlightening me, he sits down. And it's one of those issues we don't know how to resolve it. You can't resolve it by a show of hands. It's a deep moral question. You can't take a vote. There are 80 of us. And then somebody stands up and he says, what would my mother say? My mother would be an African woman, maybe four years schooling, not very really knowledgeable about the world, but a strong sense of right and wrong. My mother would say, there's something strange about the ANC. Here we are examining our own failures and what about all the violence against us over the centuries? Where's the balance? And Professor Kada Asmal, who was dean at the law school at uh, Trinity College in Dublin, stood up and said, comrades, what we need is a truth commission that will hear all the allegations from all sides we knew overwhelmingly it would be about the apartheid, what they did to us, but we would have to come forward and acknowledge what we've done. So our Truth Commission idea was born out of a need to deal with our own failures as ANC, not to expose the crimes of the other side. We draft our constitution, it's signed, it's sealed, we have a party late at night, and I'm invited to go to London to speak to the CIIR, Catholic Institute of International Relations, given us a lot of support. And I report on the Constitution, and I'm amused because they're putting me up in a very, very modest hotel near King's Cross. I'm amused because as cons 
the negotiations advanced, our accommodation got better. <laughs> and now I'm back to my grassroots accommodation. And the relevance is, I'm about to go to sleep, and there's a knock on my door, excuse me interrupting you, we've received a telex from, from, from South Africa, it's very urgent. You remember telexes? You put off the strips at the side. And I read it. And there's no paper in this hotel, so I have to write my answer on the back of the telex and give it to the person waiting. And it says, there's a crisis emerged. The generals were told that by Declerc, they would get amnesty in a democratic South Africa. And they look at the constitution, there's no amnesty. They feel betrayed. They're not planning to take over. They're just going to resign their commissions and go abroad. They are defending democracy. They will defend the elections. They know about plans to destroy the elections. They will deal with that, but not if they're going to go to jail afterwards. So I turn over the piece of paper and I say, we can't give a blanket amnesty for all the horrible things done, but we can link amnesty to a truth commission. And that's why the South African Truth Commission got its very special character. You had to come forward and acknowledge what you'd done in order to get amnesty. So this is now the institution set up. We amend our constitution and we say that the untold crimes and injustices of the past must be acknowledged and recognized, but not in a spirit of vengeance or retaliation, but in a spirit of Ubuntu and reconciliation. And that became the basis for amnesty shall be granted, but Parliament can determine the mechanisms for doing it. The TRC is formed. It starts at work. It's very contentious in South Africa today. I feel it did extraordinary work, not because of the report, but we saw on TV, we heard the lamentations of people who'd, the one woman whose son had come out of prison, out of his mind, his hair falling out, poisoned, others. It was not like a court of law with this cold, detached, desiccated interaction. The truth came pouring out there. And it was the people speaking of their pain and their suffering. And afterwards, the people who'd done these awful things in their suits, reading sometimes their statements, but acknowledging the first time, they are acknowledging the torture, the violation, the assassinations. It was astonishing. It was like a huge drama playing out in our country. And I kept imagining why Afterwards, when I'm giving a lecture, it was after the O.J. Simpson trial, nobody knew exactly what had happened. And here we have a truth commission that's not structured, and the truth is pouring out. And I came up with a theory of four kinds of truth. There's observational truth, called microscopic truth. You define an area, determine the measurables, see the changes over time. And there's logical truth. And the statement that came into my head was my literary agent uh, in, in, in USA, I know for five minutes and she ends up telling me about her whole life and she ends up by saying, let's face it, Albie, men are a fundamentally flawed species. <laughs> now, if that's correct, I'm fundamentally flawed. It's the logic in it. And most forensic work, legal work is observational truth and logical truth. But there's another kind of truth, experiential truth. A notion I got from Gandhi is my experiments with truth in South Africa. The truth is so important in our lives. You deduce something from your experience. And he is attending to captured Zulu rebels, as they were called, washing their backs after they're being lashed. And he decides if the body is capable of 
so much pain, I must stop seeking pleasure for my body. And he gives up sex. So he doesn't give up sex because he's a Gandhian saying, you must be, control your desires. He didn't consult his wife, as far as I know, before taking that decision. <laughs> but out of that experience, he induced something important for his life. And experiential truth is what it was about. And finally, this dialogical truth. The interaction of all these different kinds of truth. And that was why our Truth Commission was so powerful. Because there were so many multiple truth energies, if you like, interacting with each other. And that was enormous for our country. There's no scope for denialism in South Africa because it's come out of the mouths of the killers, the assassins themselves. And as somebody put it, an American professor, it converted knowledge into acknowledgement. We knew about these things, but you know about it as factually. Apartheid's terrible, does terrible things. And for the people who'd experienced apartheid, they'd lived it. But at a national level, there wasn't that acknowledgement. And now there was acknowledgement. So that was huge for us. Later, 1988, I'm in Maputo. It's the day of the Mozambican woman. I'm about to go to the beach to relax in the morning, meetings in the afternoon, and <coughs> something terrible is happening. I don't know what it is. I mean, total, total, total darkness, and I feel another shudder, total darkness, and I hear a voice saying into the darkness, Albi, this is Ivo Garrido. He's telling me this in Portuguese. You're in Maputo Central Hospital. Your arm is in lamentable condition. I say, what happened? And a woman's voice says, it was a car bomb. And I feel joy. I know I'm safe. I'm in Frelimo's hands. I'm not being kidnapped and being taken to South Africa. And I faint back into the darkness. And some time passes. And I'm feeling very light. Happy. I'm lying on my back. I can't see anything. My eyes are covered. And I tell myself a joke. But Jaime Cohn, who like me is a Jew, he falls off a bus. It's an old joke, some of you might know it. And he does this, and someone said, Jaime, I didn't know you were Catholic. What do you mean Catholic? Spectacles, testicles, <laughs> wallet and watch. <laughs> and for some reason I started with testicles. <laughs> and I tried all my life to be macho. Never succeeded, but for 15 minutes I had fame in the camps, and the first thing Comrade Alby did was reach for his balls. <laughs> Seemed to be okay. Wallet, my heart, if that's damaged, I'm in trouble. Seemed to be okay. There's a crater in my head, but seems to be okay. Watch. I've lost an arm. I've only lost an arm. I've only lost an arm. Somebody said that's the definition of an optimist. I've only <laughs> lost an arm. But I feel triumphant. I've only lost an arm. That moment every freedom fighter is waiting for. Will they come for me? Will they come today? If they come, will I be brave? And they'd come for me and they'd try to kill me and I'd survive. And I had a total, total, utter conviction as I got better, my country would get better. That was 19... 88. I'm in hospital afterwards recovering in London and learning to sit up, learning to get onto the commode, learning to stand, learning to write, feeling quite tripper. And I receive a letter one day. Remember letters? You used to lick the stamps. <laughs> and I open it. Don't worry, Comrade Albie, we will avenge you. Signed, Bobby. Avenge me? We're going to cut off the arm, blind in one eye. Is that the kind of country we want? And I say to myself, if we get democracy, if we get freedom, that will be my soft vengeance. Roses and lilies will grow out of my arm. And I hear afterwards, a few weeks later, have you heard, have you heard, they've caught one of the bombers. 
in Mozambique, and I say to myself, if he's put on trial and the evidence is insufficient to prove beyond reasonable doubt that he's guilty and he's acquitted, that will be my soft vengeance because then we're living under the rule of law. And that's more important than the one rascal goes to jail. So the theme soft vengeance became the theme of my life afterwards. And the soft vengeance then is coming back to South Africa, helping to write the new constitution, voting as an equal for the first time. That's powerful. Getting onto the court to defend everything you've been fighting for, that's powerful. And then another kind of soft vengeance and coming here to Sussex reminded me of something that I've completely forgotten. We build the new court building in the heart of the old fort prison in Johannesburg where Gandhi and Mandela had been locked up. We South Africans can brag we have the only jail in the world where both Gandhi and Mandela were locked up. <laughs> and that's where we build our court, right in the heart of that prison. And what I remembered coming back here for this lecture, Basil Spence, not the building here, but going to Coventry, Coventry Cathedral, bombed during the war, and putting up this beautiful new building next to the ruin. You don't demolish the ruin. You put the new next to the old, the swords into plowshare, the memory of it. It was implanted in my head. I was one of those who chose the site to put up our new building in the heart of the old prison. Sought vengeance. And it's Ubuntu, if you like. This phrase used in our constitution and used by my colleague Ivan Mohoro in the very first case we had on capital punishment and why we reject capital punishment. Ubuntu, that African concept, way of life, guiding principle. I am a person because you're a person. I can't separate my humanity from acknowledging your humanity. And I strengthen my autonomy by recognizing your dignity. I don't weaken it. It's a complete transformation of this idea of freedom means I can keep you away and push you away and do what I damn well like and no one must interfere. It's acknowledging, embracing human interdependence and feeling I'm more free, not less free, as a result. Henry now, this is all the background. I see him staring at me. So this is the man I tried to kill. I'm staring at him, this man who tried to kill me. We hadn't met each other, we didn't know each other. But I was on this side, he was on that side. We walked to my chambers, he's striding like a soldier, and I used my best judge's ambulation to try and slow him down. We sit down, we talk, we talk, we talk. He tells me what a good student he was. He's so proud how he rose up in the army so quickly to become one of the leaders of the hit squad. It was kind of weird. <laughs> but he gives me information about the attack on me. It was planned and then it was aborted for a while and then he heard afterwards. And now he's going to the Truth Commission. And I'm glad he's come to me. I'm glad he's talking to me as a human being. Maybe it's self-serving. Maybe he wants to know whether I'm going to denounce him. And I get a message from the TRC and I say, I don't support his application, I don't oppose his application, it's in your hands. And he is granted amnesty, he did tell the truth. And I forget about Henry, I'm carrying on with my work, I'm carrying on with my work, and the end of the year is a party, and we work very hard as judges. And I'm tired, and I'm going with my friend, and the music is loud, we come there, and I hear a voice saying, Albie, Albie, I look, it's Henry. These are filmmakers, they were making a film about only two soldiers who went to the Truth Commission, lots of security people did, and he's beaming. He's beaming and he comes up to me and he said, 
because I'd said to him when I said goodbye, Henry, I can't shake your hand. Go to the Truth Commission, maybe you'll meet one day, who knows. And he walks away now, he's not striding like a soldier. And he said, I went to the Truth Commission and I spoke to Bobby and Sue and Farouk, people also in Maputo, could have been victims of the bomb. I told them everything and you said, and I said, Henry, I've only got your face to tell me what you're saying is the truth. And I put out my hand and I shook his hand. He went away beaming. I almost fainted. But I heard afterwards that Henry had suddenly left the party, gone home, and cried for two weeks. I don't know if it's true. I'm not even checking up because I want to believe it's true. <laughs> and for me, that's more important. He's not my friend. I won't say, Henry, let's go to a movie or... <coughs> I don't want to meet him. But if I'm sitting in a bus and he sits down next to me and says, oh, Henry, how are you getting on? And it's we're living in the same country, not as friends. But he's taken that little step. He's acknowledged. He's acknowledged what he's done. I believe he was even helping our security in different ways afterwards. And for me, it was just that little bit of mysterious ugliness of destiny. Boom, the bomb. You don't know where it comes from. There's a human hand behind it, a person behind it. I'm a little more secure on this earth. And I've never used the word Ubuntu in relation to myself. But I feel our Truth Commission represented restorative justice, it's called sometimes. It's, you don't go in for hanging, you're going for healing. It's been very uneven. There are lots of people who didn't get amnesty from the truth, they didn't come forward. And a very strong and powerful demand that they be prosecuted. And there were false inquests people tortured to death and so on. They're being now reopened now. That's restoring justice. It's not the enemy of restorative justice, and that, that's terrific. But I feel, just as I felt so proud of this young South African, I feel proud of our achievement in South Africa. We have huge problems. Overwhelmingly, they stem from what we inherited. But we've also made terrible mistakes, and we've done wrong things ourselves, wrong things. We have to take account of that. But we've got a country. We've got a constitution. We've got a court that's doing brilliant work. We have elections that are free and fair, and we've had five elections. And the ruling party steps down when they lose elections. You've got a free press. You've got a lively press. You've got an energetic population. And we've got... I'm happy to say you're not unique. I hope you never feel that you're unique. But we've got loads and loads and loads of bright young people who have pizzazz, they're curious, they're challenging, they use language beautifully, they're questing. I feel I see the young Albie in your generation. And I'm glad. I, I used to say in the last days of the struggle against to bring down apartheid, the paradox of our lives is that we're fighting with all our passion to create a boring society. <laughs> and by that I mean you don't have to risk everything, 27 years in jail, being blown up to achieve the things that we want. But that quest for something better, that determination not to put up with rubbish and nonsense, that willingness to work with others, and that broad spirit of Ubuntu, it's not just South Africa that needs it. UK needs Ubuntu. United States needs Ubuntu. Uh, the rest of Africa understands Ubuntu and needs Ubuntu. And that's what gives me the the confidence and, and the courage to speak. I'm remembering Colonel Draper. I didn't even know 
that his first name was Gerald. <laughs> I heard it for the first time from Simon Fanshaw, Gerald Draper. He was just colonel to me. And it's not a choice between accountability through war crimes tribunals or restorative justice. We've shared experience with Northern Ireland, with Colombia, different parts of the world, and we find people are aching for something other than retribution. Retribution means it never ends. It just means we are stronger now, we're in charge, and then they'll be fighting back. And so I see this as a kind of a dialectic, uh, starting with that stern voice of rigid in terms of his physical being, Colonel Draper, but implacable and in insisting on certain fundamental norms and accountability and processes, and a softer complementarity, each engaging with the other. So here is the result of my work. I would come every week. Once a month, I would give him a chapter in my book. I saw the pile getting higher and higher. He never read it. <laughs> he never told me that I'm on the right track or the wrong track. He told me these beautiful stories about Beautiful, beautifully told stories about terrible things that had happened. And here is the book, published by Heinemann's on behalf of Sussex University Press. And I just have to say thank you, University of Sussex. You allowed me to capture a part of my life, stories from our nation, in a way that was serious, that was thoughtful. And curiously, at the end, what was my last word going to be about this judiciary that was so complicated, so terrible, and yet with such interesting little features? And should I denounce the judges as simply giving a veneer of justice and fairness? completely, the system's got to go? Or should I see that we've got to transform our institutions one day in South Africa? And this was in 19, actually 69, 70, 71 I'm writing this. <clears throat> Left hand, right hand, it's like Lancelot Gobbo, should I, shouldn't I? And in the end I say to myself, the judges up there and some of them are decent. The institution, we're going to need it in a new South Africa. So I don't go for the total abolish the whole judiciary, get rid of them all, they're all part of a wicked system, judges ought to resign. I put the pressure on them to use what tiny space is available, not to give a veneer of justification to apartheid. And some of those judges became my colleagues on the Constitutional Court in South Africa. I think I'm happy now that I came to the conclusion that I did then. And they were brilliant. They hated and loathed apartheid. They were strong on procedure, on, on the crafting. You need to be a good craft person for anything. It's to fly a plane, to deliver a judgment. And they helped us with that. And all of that started here at the University of Sussex, not in this particular building, but in this particular institution. Thank you, University of Sussex. <laughs> <laughs>